Hello all, I'm Jacob Melcher. I'm a technical product manager at a studio working on the Instill project. Um, and I'll be discussing how best to manage a fast product focused technical project. Uh, so when I think of a project, I usually think of two different types of goals. They are the product focus goals and the technical focus goals, even though the majority of these are intertwined and solving one helps the other. Uh, the product focus goals are usually the things the user sees. These are the user facing uh, features and the product in general. Uh, these are often client influenced and client can mean a variety of things. It can be the client you're building the project for. It can be your internal stakeholders. But in general, these are the things that you get feature requests from. On the technical side of it, the big questions here are how do we actually deliver the project? And making sure we set up the project for long-term success. And now I'll go a bit more in depth on both. Um, the major product goals I often find are to build iterable components to get user insights quickly. In my opinion, it's often better to launch a working feature at 80% than wait a few weeks for 100%. And there are a few reasons for that. First, I think it's always beneficial to release thing, something early to get insights on it, um, especially if the, the extra time it will take to get it 100% will take a bit. This is also beneficial if something changes with the users or there's another problem you hadn't realized. You can change that extra 20% you're doing to fit what the current goal is without having to potentially go back on your work. Um, move fast, but don't break stuff. Uh, this has been especially important. You do want to do releases to users to show them the, the cool features you're building but you want to make sure not to break their stuff. Uptime and consistency are product features. You can build a really great product, but if no one can access the product, it's not actually that good. Um, and knock on wood, not breaking stuff has been kind of one of the key features of our fast agile team. Uh, we can work fast, but we also have to slow down enough when we get close to releases to, to test and check all of our code before it goes out. And a benefit of being a both a product-focused development team and an agile team is we can add features that weren't known a month ago. I've often been at companies that try having a six-month roadmap, and every single time we have a six-month roadmap, something changes month two and it all goes out the trash. And it's much better just to understand that there's going to be some unexpected and just reach that when it comes to it instead of trying to plan everything out, especially on these smaller projects, um, both team wise and kind of feature set wise. Um, on the technical side of the goals, um, just like how we had on the product side, building flexible components is super helpful. These can be flexible not only in what they actually do, but adding feature features features to it. You don't want to make them very rigid in a way where um, any minor change you need to do, you need to rewrite a, a significant portion of that code. Um, one of the biggest questions I've uh, faced is making sure to know when to make the correct design decisions without taking too long. Um, and this kind of goes hand in hand with the other one about being smart about the decisions you make in a fast environment, you can't necessarily take two to three weeks thinking about a design decision and what the, the quote unquote perfect decision is. You need to know when good enough is actually good enough. Um, because again, you don't always have to be 100% right. Um, and some of the things to think about um, when you're trying to make these decisions is which decisions need to be solved today um, does this actually affect what you're currently building or could it affect it in the future? Um, make sure not to box yourself in or over engineer. Um, build it good for now and make sure it doesn't box you in for about three months, but you don't have to be building components in a way where, you know, you're thinking ahead to a use case that's two years in the future. That just won't keep you working quickly, and it'll often end up coming back and being more annoying to deal with. 
Um, and that kind of goes for, you know, plan for tomorrow without blocking today. Uh, it is very beneficial to know what limitations you have. For example, if you have an API that um, can work up to a million requests per minute, but right now you have a user base of a thousand or 10,000, you don't need to solve that problem. It's not actually currently an issue for you, but knowing that when you do reach that scale, you will have to rebuild it is important. And that is something in the future you can do it. And then as always work to minimize mistakes. Um, they're always gonna happen. The key part is to try to make it in a way where these mistakes are often you know, one to two hour mistakes that take to fix and not two to three days. Um, and over all this, it's a general sense of communication is key. That's how you minimize these and make the correct decisions. Um, some of the common problems, I put problems in quotes there because they're not all that bad, uh, that I've ran into um, trying to manage a, a fast product focused development team is sometimes well-written stories are actually the delaying factor. Uh, my developers will finish more things than I can give out to them, um, which is every manager's dream. That's not bad at all. Um, and then often it will actually take longer to review and test the code than it does for a developer to write the code, especially with smaller tickets, um, which again, I'm perfectly happy about. And then some of the speed of these projects comes at the cost of ambiguity and uncertainty. Um, so both a, as a manager and a general developer, I think being able to live with some of the ambiguity and uncertainty is what's needed to, to be on fast teams and to build good products. Um, I mean, we've, I guess, kind of learned to love it um, because it, it isn't actually bad uh, in most of the cases. Um, so looking at leading the team, some of the things I, I look to do is oftentimes a manager or a tech lead may feel like they're the blocker um, because they have different meetings all day. They're stuck on working on another project and they can't write stories for this project. They can't review the PRs, um, which is often true. But I would often say know your team and trust them. You should be surrounded by good developers. I know on my team, I'm surrounded by really competent and really great developers. So I know what they can handle. And I know sometimes it's perfectly okay to allow them to, to go off and deal with this thing that I would usually do, but I'm busy and because I don't want to block them. Um, and delegate those as needed. You know, it, uh, I'm not a giant stickler to the whole agile process. If there's a small story that needs to be written and one of my devs is happy doing it, more power to them um, if, it, if it keeps them working fast. Um, and then I found that being open about your process is super beneficial. Um, having everyone on the team know the agile process you're following and kind of what you think about doing different things is helpful so that if they do need to do them, they can do. And then facilitating retrospectives is very important. Um, how we do retrospectives is we look at the last sprint, which for us is often a week, and we write down things that went well, things that went poorly in the form of I love slash I like, um, I wish, and then at the end we change it to be I will, and these are things that we're looking to change. And the thing about being a fast team with one week sprints I found very beneficial is you can look to implement those changes next sprint, which is next week. And so you can look at past retrospectives and quickly see if you're making those changes that you said you would and if those are good or not. Uh, so it gives you really fast feedback. Um, so some of the things that have worked for us uh, working this way is pair programming. At first, I wasn't the biggest fan of pair programming coming from other companies. It, fe it felt like it was just someone watching someone else code at the computer and it's taking over too. 
Um, but I found the way we do it with actual interactions between the two while they're pair programming, it helps to reduce the actual development time, of course, because oftentimes someone gets stuck less with another resource. It helps to reduce the, the pull request review time because a lot of the first level PR comments like removing uh, removing comments, removing console logs are all often caught before the, the pair pushes. And it's helpful to find bugs early with the testing and specifically logic bugs, as those are the most difficult to often fix uh, once they've been released. And another thing with pair programming that's really helped is with onboarding, which I'll go into a bit later. But uh, sometimes, even though it will seem weird to pull um, a lead developer, someone that's pretty busy, to pair program on something very small, if it helps that person onboard quicker and get a better understanding of the code base, it is often more beneficial in the long run to do that because it will save the time uh, overall, even though it doesn't save the, the busy person all that much time. We start technical discussions early. We often started in what I call the estimation or the scoping phase. So this is before we even try to start work on it. This is being introduced to the feature. And this is beneficial in two ways. It helps introduce the problem so people can think over it for the next day or two. And it's it also helps to have an answer to that question before development actually starts so that everyone's on the same page and we have an understanding of what we're going to do. And it's not one of those situations where, you know, when you put up the PR two days later, someone's like, oh, no, we should do it this completely different way. And you potentially ruin two days of development. Um, and then we've also really tried to organize technology that helps you and the team uh, increasing their agency, um, making it beneficial for them to work. Um, and some of that organizing technology for you uh, goes back to some of these technical questions I always ask. So when you're thinking of your tech stack, think of the entirety of your project, you know, the repository, the pipelines, build and deploy, and not just the actual code base, and for example, which JavaScript framework you're looking for. Um, and if you're trying to refactor and you're not on a new project, find some of the major pain points for what's taking the longest in that process and look for those to fix. For example, is your repository set up in a way where there's often merge conflicts every PR, or there's 30 minute build times before deploying, or are there flaky automation tests? Anything that is a pain point that slows down development is always worth looking into fixing. Um, how easy is it for a new developer to start work on the project is I think a really key feature of any code base. Sometimes you'll join a project where the README is basically a novel in itself. Um, and you, especially in a product focused development team, you don't want it to take two or three days just for a developer to get up and running and to you know, actually see the code base run. Um, you want them realistically day one or day two putting up PRs in that project and seeing um, their work go into a feature. And then how long does it take to make a change? I think it's also very important just in a general technical side. You can have a great code base, but if there's so many pipeline processes where it'll take four hours minimum to, to get out a hot fix, and I've had code bases like that, it's really not beneficial for moving fast, both for the developers and also, you know, having to try to, to get out this quick hot fix and it taking half a day of work. Um, so now I'll go over a bit, you know, how product focused development has made the process easier, my life easier, the team's life easier. Um, developers are able to onboard working on one feature at a time that can be abstracted out. For example, if a new developer is trying to work on adding a new section to the account profile, they shouldn't have to worry about what the checkout logic is, what the login logic is. They should be able just to work in that small section of the code base. And that's often a difficulty with some bigger projects, either monolithic or also just kind of complicated. 
because there'll often be a separation between the front end repository and the back end repository. And they'll have to really understand the structure of both to do a relatively simple project as they'll have to understand what the actual calls from the API are coming, the data from it, and then also how to make that, that account change and uh, in the front end. And sometimes this is half of the battle. Uh, I found it helps foster a uh, get stuff done attitude. Uh, when new features are built quickly, this is especially true for both the clients and also new people of the project that just got onboarded. If they can see a feature built, you know, day one, day two, and it's it's out for users to to use, that's just a great feeling that you know they join the team. It helps, and, and they've done something correctly. It helps set the tone for how this project's going to work going forward, and Hopefully it should motivate them to want to work more. Um, another thing it should do is focus on how it betters the product rather than pure technology. Um, most of my project's main engineering decisions and technical decisions have had to have some type of user value or end, end user value associated with it, which seems to be correct. I've been at some companies that have spent a year changing to a new tech stack to see maybe a 1% gain in speed, which works well for maybe some really big companies that can do that. But for fast and agile and smaller teams, that's just not worthwhile at all. So it's always beneficial to see what technologies uh, you can use and what problems they actually solve instead of just doing something to do it and make it look cool. Because at the end of the day, your end users don't care what JavaScript framework you, you're you using. They really just care what um, what the the feature and the, in this case, a website looks like. And along with that, it's important to decide what tech stack works for you and the team. Uh, there's always a lot of decisions that go into that. For example, uh, these are both project decisions and internal technical decisions. For example, is your project only web? Is it native? Is it combined? Would you prefer having you know, a different repository for each application? Would you prefer trying to use something like React Native? These are all decisions that are kind of driven by what the uh, project actually needs. And along with that, it's very beneficial to know your developers uh, and what experiences and knowledge they bring. For example, if you have, if you're building a native app and you have a team of three that all know Objective C, sure, Swift is now considered the, you know, the new technology for iOS, but you should probably build an Objective C because you have all that knowledge base and you're not then having to try to train three more, uh, developers in that new technology. Um, and while my project's been in the middle of a refactoring, we've been using Nullstack, which has been working really well for us, especially in a product-focused way, because we're able to split up these general product features, whether it be you know, search, sign-in, account, all into their own little section and a component where someone can work on that just by themselves, and they don't need to truly understand all the integratedness of it. And since it's all in one file, it, it does help the one of the points I mentioned previously where they can see all of what touches. So when someone gets onboarded to a project, we can say, here's the account section and here are the account calls. And they can easily see that some of that logic in between and not have to worry about, you know, trying to find where this specific API call lives in four folders in, in your back end system. So I'm very excited to see how going forward with, with more of the refactoring, how that helps us onboard users quicker. And with that, I will open it up to any questions. As always, AE is looking for new great developers who are perfectly okay working in fast environments like I've described. And then there's also a link to my current project. If you'd like to check that out.
Um, okay. Mortaro asked, what kind of profile would you like to see in a developer that applies to work with you? Um, I found with the developers I work with in projects, having some understanding of the product side is always beneficial. Um, honestly, tickets are never going to be written 100%. And not all of the you know, acceptance criteria are always going to be set. So it's very important to have someone that can look at a problem and think, hmm, maybe this doesn't fully work this way, or maybe there's a better way of doing this, rather than just following something to a T where we get towards the end and realize, you know, maybe this could have done better. And then also just a general sense of flexibility, being able to live with the ambiguity is always beneficial. Um, you know, we're a fast team, we're a fast environment. Uh, some things often change, you know, mid sprint, mid week, and just being able to understand that sometimes these things happen, live with, you know, some of that. And really, I mean, honestly, I found some, some people actually really enjoy and love that. I'm one of them. Um, so just being able to kind of roll with the punches and understand how to work in that type of environment where maybe you can't go off alone, hide in the corner and work on this ticket for three days. Uh, because there's a lot of things either happening day to day or also just external structures where, you know, oftentimes instead of spending three days alone on it, maybe it's better to spend two days but pair program someone on it if it means the end product is better. Um, and then the follow-up question is, what kind of profile do I think the client must have to work with a product-focused team? I think the client should have um, another general sense. Of course, you, you want the client to have a little bit less of ambiguity because they should be the one driving these, these features. But having a really good sense of flexibility of, you know, sometimes you want X, but it may take two weeks. But we can bring up another decision and say, hey, I know you wanted this. This other thing is really close, but it'll only take us two days. Would you prefer that? And having them be comfortable um, hearing and knowing those decisions is especially important. Um, as in the end, you're you know you're trying to to satisfy the client. And I think communication is is another super important thing for the client. And I should have mentioned it more in the show, but the underlying fix for almost all of these is just to over communicate um, between you and the client, you and your team members, um, especially working. I mean, I've said fast often enough, but working in an environment where, you know, basically no day is wasted. So you don't want to waste an entire developer's day working on something just for the client to end up coming back and saying, oh, no, I meant this other thing. Um, so I think in general, you know, clients that understand there will often have to be decisions and they can't just have everything their way and are very receptive of those decisions because at the end, they should also believe that the way we're doing this is building them the best product. And I do believe that product focused development does do that. Um, 